Alpha Trevintrum is responsible for a great deal of translation from Latin into Old English, most of which was undertaken as part of his homiletic and or pedagogical activities. Being taught by key political figures in the Benedictine reform movement, Alfred was understandably keen to promote orthodoxy in said translations. Here I will explore, in the case of Alfred's translations of the Passion of St. Eugenia, with brief comparisons of the non alfredian vita of another transvestite St. Euphrosine, the gatekeeping process by which Alfred controls the flow of information into the vernacular and in so doing seeks to paint a homogeneous picture of his Latin source material. Prominent figures of the Benedictine reform movement, such as Bishop Athelwald, championed Latinity and cultivated a highly complex literary style, which Michael Lafferge has dubbed hermeneutic Latin. Athelwald's pupil Alfred is unique among the prolific Benedictines in eschewing this style for a simpler one. As Rebecca Stevenson points out, however, Alfred is not unique in expanding the scope of vernacular literature with Athelwald, for example, producing a translation of the Regularis Concordia in Easy English. The cultivation of a more difficult Latinity contracted its readership and expanded the uses to which the vernacular was put, with Athelwald's Old Minster School in particular developing as a centre of vernacular production, replete with a distinctive set of vocabulary known as Winchester vocabulary, which Alfred himself exemplifies. Alfred is rare among Old English writers in attaching prefaces to his work, wherein the choice of language in these prefaces is deliberate. Those in English are commonly addressed to laypersons and reference monas Alfred's monastic education, while those in Latin generally address ecclesiastical figures and contain details about his sources and methods. For instance, in the preface to his translation of Genesis, Alfred relates the story of Sum Massa Prelst, after the book Genesis and Hecuta Pedal Liden Understandan who preaches heresy because he does not understand that the old law is different to the new. This incident implies that susceptibility to heresy derives not only from subpart linguistic ability, but also from the absence of orthodox interpretive frameworks. Said susceptibility provides Alfred's justification for changing the words of his source texts to make his translations unambiguously orthodox in their contents and therefore suitable for dissemination. The prefaces also reveal Alfred's concern with book production and copying, wishing the scribes not intersperse copies of his work with anonymous texts. However, this wish was clearly not followed in the case of the Lives of Saints, whose earliest and most intact witness, this being the British Library MS Cotton Jr.'s E.VII, which you are now seeing on the page, is probably not far removed, in fact, from Alfred's original manuscript, given its intact prologue. Donald G. Scragg paints this picture of a seemingly ad hoc corpus of vernacular saints' lives prior to and continuing after Alfred's writing, with multiple translations of the same Latin source occasionally surviving. Some of these translations, such as the Old English Life of St. Giles, may have been made by other Benedictines as they contain high proportions of Winchester vocabulary. In that context, then, Alfred's constant self-identification shows a concern to authenticate the lives of saints by associating it with Winchester rather than merely reproducing the old minster's literary accomplishments. Alfred's Lives of Saints, hereafter shortened to LOS, forms part of the vernacular corpus expanded by Benedictine efforts. The LOS Old English preface addresses the two laymen, Aldam and Athelware and his son Athelmar, who commissioned the book, though the book's prefaces and content speaks to another, mixed-gendered audience also. And this is often interpreted as evidence of these men incorporating monastic modes of worship into their private lives. The Latin preface to the Lives of Saints reveals much about Alfred's translation style and the Lives of Saints background, so it is worth quoting here. And I have given you the English translation on the screen. Placuit novis in isto codicello ordinare passiones etiam vel vita sanctorum melorum, quos non vulgus sed cenevite officis venerantur. Unum cubi uscire hoc volumen negentibus, quod nolem ale cubi ponere duos imperatores si vicetares in hac nazione, simul sicut in latinitati legimus, sed unum imperatorem in persecutione martirum ponimus ubique, sicutiendo nostra uni regi subditur, et usitata este unua rege, non de duobus locus. Nec potuimus in ista translazione, semper verbum ex verbo transferre, sed tamen sensu ex sensu. Sit ju convenimis in sancta scriptura, diligenter curavimus verbile simplici et aperta locutione, quasi nus proficia taurensibus. Hoc sciendum etiam, quod polixiores passiones verbiamus verbis, non adeo, 
centre. As will be seen below in the study of St. Eugenia, Alfred's prefer preference for brevity is indeed followed in the lives of saints. His translations retain just enough of their source material to communicate the cathetical messages Alfred desires, excusing those omissions that are deemed tedious to the unlearned reader. I concur with E. Gordon Watley that the nature of said omissions can reveal a translator's attitudes, whether towards his source material or his audience or the task of translation. And as will be shown below, much of Alfred's censorship seems to have motives beyond brevity and simplicity. Alfred's only acknowledged metaphor of translating multiple emperors as one is indeed followed in the translation. Philippus's accusers, Cordem Imperatoribus Querem Nefonunt, in the God and Corpus Legendary, which we will discuss below, um, who accuse him before the before the uh, emperor, but they ragged on Philippum Tolan Forasar and Cata in the Lives of Saints in the Old English. After recognizing this demonstrable incongruence with the words in source material, Alfred nonetheless assures the reader that he has translated sensu ex sensu, asserting his authority as a pedagogue to decide what is the sense of the original text. Its Latin preface also lays out the purpose of the lives of saints, to provide translations of the lives which cenebite officis venerantur, are venerated in monastic offices. Defining the volume as specifically monastic is an attempt to paint a particular picture of monastic literary culture to the non-Latin laity. But Michael Lavage points out that the feast days of Alfred's Sanctorale, for instance, do not often correspond to those of contemporary calendars. Moreover, Joyce Hill notes that many of the saints in the lives of saints seem to have been little venerated in England. Such lives from earlier centuries promoting a different kind of monasticism risk being misinterpreted by those outside of the monastic enclosure. Another reason for Alfred to be selective in his translation process. Therefore, throughout this process, Alfred is, both explicitly and silently, reworking the sources of his lives of saints to present a coherent image of the Latin monastic literary culture, likely inaccessible to its readers. Now I will briefly examine the evidence of manuscripts containing Eugenia's passion. The earliest and most intact witness of the lives of saints is British Library M.S. Cotton Julius E.V.I.I in which Eugenia's passion occupies folios 9b to 15r, and it is probably not far removed from Alfred given its intact prologues. It also contains texts such as the life of St. Euphrosyne, which on stylistic grounds have been identified as non-Alfredian, contrary to his stated desire in its Old English preface, the scribes copy the work faithfully. Whether well transmitted or not, the lives of saints is one of Alfred's most copied works, with copies of it surviving in 15 different manuscripts. Patrick Zeto has identified that Alfred's source for the um, Passion of St. Eugenia was likely the so-called Cotton Corpus Legendary, a collection of 165 saints' lives put together likely on the continent, but surviving in its earliest form in a witness produced in the third quarter of the 11th century and arranged according to the calendar year. This legendary was at some point split into two separate manuscripts, London British Library MS Cotton Lira E.I, parts 1 and 2, and Cambridge Corpus Christi College MS009, in which Eugenius Passio occupies folios 205v to 213v. Patrick Zato states that of the manuscripts he examined, only one, Brussels Bibliothek Royal MS 7984, contained the quote unquote combined passion of Saint Eugenia, combined with those of Protus Hyacinthus and her father Philippus of the Cotton Corpus legendary, and that it therefore represents the passion's rarest variant. However, identification of early manuscript relationships in the transmission of Eugenia's Passio is necessary before the Cotton Corpus legendary version can be deemed especially unusual. In fact, one combined passion may be found in a Cluny legendarium dated to the early 11th century. Bibliothèque Nationale de France, MS Latin, 3377, sorry, MS Latin 3779 between folios 11v to 22v. And this manuscript actually divides the Vita and Passio of Eugenia and her companions into two separate sections, as you can see on the screen here. The Court and Corpus legendary, however, does not do this. And it, in, the, uh, in the French manuscript, we can see there is a rubric indicating the Passion of St. Eugenia at the end of folio 18R. Following Campbell Bonner's view that the martyrdoms of Eugenia and her family were later additions to the legend, 
early Greek iterations of which end with the family reunion scene family from classical romance, it is possible that Eugenia's Vita and Passio were transmitted as distinct but united texts quite early in the Latin tradition, as in BMF MS Latin 3379, which is a Greek version of the legend. The martyr's embodiment in suffering is an essential component of gendering in both original and vernacular sources, and so, if Campbell's view were to be demonstrated in the early manuscript transmission of Eugenia's story, this would demonstrate that this would-be transitioning of her vita into a passio also causes Eugenia's refeminization after the family reunion. It is worth noting that a summarized account of Eugenia's life survives in the Old English martyrology also. More specifically, it survives as marginalia to an Old English translation of Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica in Cambridge Corpus Christi College, MS 041, between pages 125 and 128, and this is a manuscript dated to the mid-11th century, although the text itself, Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica being earlier, and the Old English Martyrology was likely composed in the 9th century. My own transcriptions of Virginia's Passio in the Old English Martyrology, as well as the Lives of Saints and Cotton Corpus Legendary, are provided in the description below. The Old English Martyrology implies that Eugenia's transvestism was in response to her father Philippus wishing to give her to a noble as a spouse, an aspect not found in either the Lives of Saints nor the Cotton Corpus Legendary versions. Unlike these two, the Old English Martyrology also describes her healing the blind. Lastly, within it, Eugenia is imprisoned for 10 days and nights, as opposed to 20 in the other accounts. These discrepancies suggest that the Old English martyrologist was using a version of Eugenia's life unrelated to the Cotton Corpus legendary tradition, and possibly quite corrupt. Christine Rauer identifies the Bibliotheca Hagiographica Latina's Passio Sancti Eugeniae, BHL 2666, nights, as the Old English martyrologist's source. Although here, as above, a better understanding of the manuscript transition of Eugenia's Latin passion of Vita is needed. With such varied transmissions of Latin texts, Alfred's provision of vernacular translations thereof to a capable lay Latinist serves to convey the image of a centralised and coherent Latin literary tradition, which would also underscore his concern with scribes copying the volume faithfully. Indeed, the Old English martyrologist's work may reflect precisely the kind of unsupervised Latinity which Alfred feared would lead to yidwill, or heresy. Here follows an explanation of discrepancies between the lives of saints and Cotton Corpus legendary versions of St. Eugenia's Passion and what they reveal about Alfred's goals. First, it would be instructive to recount the element of her story shared by both. Eugenia is born to Claudia and Philippus, the overseer of Alexandria, wherein she is educated alongside her eunuchs, Protus and Hyacinthus. Upon discovering the teaching of Paul the Apostle, she wishes to learn more about Christianity, and so she leaves the city. The eunuchs cut her hair in a masculine style before they approach a Christian villa and are taken in by Bishop Hellenus, to whom God reveals Eugenia's identity in a dream. The bishop baptises the three, after which Eugenia lives in that minster in male disguise. Later, Eugenia is selected by her brothers as abbot. Thereafter, she works many healing miracles, which attracts the accuser Melancia, who eventually tries to seduce the abbot. Upon rejection, Melancia complains to Philippus, her father, that she was raped, and this prompts a trial which has Eugenia and her brothers brought in chains before Philippus, her father. And at this trial, Eugenia reveals her womanhood and is reunited with her family, who convert to Christianity. Eugenia founds a monastery for virgins and eventually converts Basila. She, along with Protestant and Hyacinthus, are martyred for Christ. The emperor attempts to drown and burn Eugenia but fails, so she is thrown in prison where Christ appears to her and foretells her death. After her martyrdom, Eugenia appears in a vision to her mother Claudia, previsaging her own death. In the case of the Passion of St. Eugenia, the things Zalfish leaves out of his translation are of three main types. 1. Omission of details or accounts which are superfluous to the saint in question. 2. Omission of details regionalizing Christian practice. And 3. The omission of potentially controversial themes. Discussion here will focus largely on the third category as it's the most interesting. All three kinds can be seen in the large section of the Cotton Corpus legendary account between folios 206b and 207, which Alvridge merely hints at in his translation. 
In this episode, Eutropius tells Eugenia and her companions about a thaumaturgical contest between Zoraeus and Hellenus, which consisted of the two agreeing to walk into fire to demonstrate the veracity of their faith before a seemingly agnostic crowd. Hellenus's inevitable victory in the contest introduces a key symbolic motif, that fire burns pagans like Zoraeus, but not Christians like Hellenus. Paul Schmarach notes that the symbolic valence of fire still carries later in the narrative, only without its foreshadowing, since Melancia's house in both the Latin and the Old English versions is burned by God after the trial, while Eugenia survives being cast into an oven. If tension between secular and Christian jurisprudence is an undercurrent of Eugenia's passion, then Alvich's removal of Zoraeus served literally to eliminate the devil's advocate. Nonetheless, this removal may also be done to retain the focus on Eugenia, since as Malcolm Godden shows, Alvich in other lives deals with pagan miracles by explaining them away as natural phenomena or as diabolic, rather than composing the his uh, compromising rather the historical authenticity of his translations by removing a key narrative device pertaining to their main characters. From a literary perspective, Eutropius' story in the Cotton Caucus Legendary serves to flesh out Hellenus' backstory, building anticipation of his arrival while prompting the reader to empathise with Eugenia by giving them the same information access. Alfred, by contrast, simply tells the reader this information about Hellenus himself. Des bischer warcht a fella wunder durch God, on him weat ich gute lord on swachtle we wissen, on er was meidnes mod him weat a meldod. However, the aesthetic elements of Alfred's symmetrical prose style compensate for the loss in narrative and character development, and here the alliteration serves to link Hellenus to his earlier miracles and the revelation of Eugenia's intentions. Warcht a wunder and weat, and is wute lord swachtle. Here, Alfred is using the mnemonic potential of his aesthetic alliteration and rhythmic prose to summarise Helenus's character with fewer and less risky words, while keeping the story focused on its protagonist. Telling the reader about Helenus, rather than showing them, appropriates Eutropius' role as expounder, unsurprising from such a homiletically minded translator as Alfred. Lastly, Alvich's mid Michelin menu supplants the Cotton Corpus legendaries Mos est apud Egyptum quonotricum eunt monasteria episcopi psalensium eos sequatra exercitus, an army which numbers amplius quam dec milia virorum, and follows Hellenus, who solas a celi veiculo trete. This is one of several instances where Alfred smooths over details of localized Christian custom in keeping with the aim of his lives of saints to recall saints universally venerated. Although included also are four English saints whose cults were widespread in Britain. And Alvarez hereby projects his reformist desires for a uni united ecclesiastical authority onto the early Christian church. Another interesting exclusion is Melancia's argument to Eugenia Non puto quod in iusta sit apud Deum, si maris esse dimieris, et floraris tempus levitsi, quod resitsi manchvasti. Although this is cast as wicked even in the original, it was clearly too risque for Alfred, whose hardline approach to cerebral, clerical celibacy exceeded even that of his Benedictine peers. Similarly dangerous are the reflections on gender trouble of Eugenia's self-defence for cross-dressing at her trial. In the Cotton Corpus legendary, Eugenia justifies this by exalting the superiority of masculinity over femininity, and so Gopiroi reads Alfred's omission of this as part of his generally more sympathetic treatment of women in the narrative. On the other hand, a shared trait makes both these speeches ripe for censorship. They represent, in Alfred's view, female characters mounting theological defences for their actions. Women's self-advocacy is apparently as unacceptable to Alfred as the secular law Eugenia's story repudiates. A curious aspect of the lives of saints, which Alfred does not substantially alter, is his description of Protus and Ias Inches. As Rhonda McDaniels notes, the Greco-Roman social role of the Eunuchus, or eunuch, had no equivalent in early medieval England, which presented a difficulty for translators. Alvich has to explain the Eugenius comparison war on eunuchi, that since belisnode. The choice to gloss eunuchi as belisnode grounds the reader's interpretation of the Latin words in its corporeal implications, but this was not the only option. In the Old English Vita Sancta Euphrasine, which is also found in the same manuscript, Eunuchus is used simply as a loan word. 
In this case, the reader can only infer from context that Eunuchus refers to a visibly more effeminate kind of man which Elfrasin can pass for, turning it into an accessible social role rather than an inaccessible bodily one. Alfred's corporealization of eunuchdom precludes Eugenia from full transformation through entering even this shadowy male gender category, as Alan J. Franson describes it, and therefore from wielding religious authority over men. In early Christian passions, the trial scene generally provides an opportunity for the same to harangue a pagan judge and jury and demonstrate the worthiness of God, with brute force execution, usually by beheading, being the dramatic climax at the end. Of the symbolic valence of Eugenia's trial, Andrew Rabin notes, The Passio Saint Eugenia thus frames the trial scene as an encounter between the laws of Caesar, Nolma of God, the former motivated by fear, characterized by infamia, and pursued through perjury in contrast with the latter, grounded in true authority, biblical justification, and holy revelation. The theme of spiritual versus secular legality can be seen in the apologies of Melancia and Eugenia respectively, the former of which has been provided above. Both characters in the Cotton Corpus legendary version exhibit insecurity over the propriety of their actions by offering unprompted defences for them at the trials, and these apologies in fact share the spiritual modus operandi, the key difference being that Melancia presumes to speak for God's desires, while Eugenia parrots male authors of scripture as she does in most of her post-baptism dialogue. Alfred removes any defence of transvestism and silences the woman through indirect speech when he reports how Eugenia seo afra famna, qua, that heo walde he silfa vidilion, on Christa anum hira clanis heodan, on maid hada wunienne manum uncus, on for thee unrathanga at fruman vagiralan, Alfred states, contradicting his earlier words, that Eugenia adopts male garb to preserve her virginity, with perhaps some comic irony in the fact that it enticed Melancia to threaten said virginity, which is a trope common in the stories of transvestite saints. This shared assumption by two temporarily disparate traditions suggests that looking through the transvestite disguise, to use Jennifer Walker's phrasing, to see a more familiar character came naturally to medieval translators of Eugenia's story. The Lives of Saints defends Eugenia not with the rhetoric, but with pacifizing revelation. Heo to tar hira yewadu, a tawada hira breost, thereby centering the breast as the signifier of womanhood, while the Latin uses her hair. Ete dicens, she did a capite tonicam, qua era vinduta, et a paro it femina. Continuing the corporeal theme, the Cotton Corpus legendary version generally masculinizes Eugenia's body by having it perform physical labor on par with her fellows in the course of her monastic duties, which Alfred does not mention to av avoid validating a woman's parity with men, and this is a situation which the Benedictine reformers oppose. Brief comparison with a translated life containing similar themes, the Vita Sancta Eufrosine and its anonymous Old English translation, reveals that vernacular transformation of the life of St. Eugenia is specific to Alfred's translation method, which could be better understood through further source material examination. The comparison here has been brief. The Vita Sancta Eufrosine's greater fidelity to its source is evident in their lengths alone and in the translator's tendency to downplay rather than remove distasteful evidence of the original wholesale. Examining the two reveals that Alfred alters his source material much more liberally than contemporary translators, and contrary to his initial claim, does not always translate sensum ex sensum.